it is so uh, wonderful to um, to see everyone and uh, and to be with all of you today and to have this really, really fabulous opportunity on a on a cold day like today to be able to uh, curl up with a book. Hopefully many of us have read it already, but that's okay if you haven't. Uh, and to um, to have this opportunity to be together. Now, one of the challenges is uh, we have this wonderful technology of Zoom, which allows us to all be in one place. And that also at times presents challenges in terms of being able to hear one another. So I am going to actually mute everyone right now. And uh, I will unmute our, our speaker when, uh, when in just a few moments. And, um, and I, while I'm muting you, I also want to encourage you, if you have questions during our, our time today, I invite you to put the questions, uh, you can send them directly to me in the chat, and then hopefully we'll, we'll get to all of those. We have a number of questions that are already planned, but, uh, but also please feel free to share any questions and I will be happy to, um, to ask those on, on your behalf. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm loving these opportunities to come together. I'll mention it again at the end, but we are going to be doing this again. Um, and that's really thanks to all of you because if people don't show up, then we aren't able to plan again for the future, but there's been such a wonderful outpouring of, um, of interest and participation. We are going to, the empty nesters are going to uh, hold uh, two more of these book discussions. One, um, April 23rd, Friday, April, they're both Fridays, April 23rd at 11 a.m. and June 25th at 11 a.m. And I know today on this very, very cold icy day, thinking about June seems so far away, but if you can believe we are already heading getting close to the one year mark of this whole pandemic experience. Uh, and through it all, being able to have these opportunities to come together is really such a blessing uh, to be able to maintain these connections with one another, uh, to be able to see each other's faces or at least our, each other's names is, a, uh, is, is part of what it means to be in community and love being able to, to participate in these, um, in these moments with, with each of you. So I am, excited and delighted to welcome our uh, our guest today, Mark Sullivan. And I'm going to uh, share a little bit about him. I was excited, you know, as soon as, as Ruth, and I want to give credit to, to Ruth Seif and, um, and Jeff Bergman for coordinating uh, these opportunities. And as soon as she mentioned uh, that we were going to be with Mark Sullivan, I was so excited. I had read his book already uh, with a, a book group I'm in and I just, I loved it and I was excited to be able to, to read it again in preparation. Mark Sullivan is the author of 18 novels, including the number one bestselling Beneath the Scarlet Sky, which we are discussing today, which has been published in 37 languages and is being made into a limited series starring Tom Holland. Mark has also worked extensively with James Patterson, with whom he wrote five number one New York Times bestsellers in the private series. Before turning to fiction, he worked as an investigative journalist. Mark lives in snowy Southwest Montana. I think he said 30 inches in the last little bit, uh, where he remains grateful for the miracle of every moment. And we are certainly grateful for this moment, maybe not miraculous uh, because of the technology that brings us together, but certainly grateful for the blessing of having you with us today. So thank you so much for, for being with us, Mark. And I, I know Mark is going to um, share a little bit before we have a little conversation and, and discussion and questions. So thank you, Mark. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm going to apologize first if I sound a little slurry. Um, about a year ago, I was diagnosed with life-threatening obstructive apnea, and I've been going through a series of maxillofacial surgeries, and I, I'm in braces, I have a spreader in the top of my mouth, and I'm relearning how to speak. So I apologize if I sound a little slurry or garbled, but I'll try not to be. 
Um, I really appreciate having the time to talk to you about uh, Pino Lella and the book. It's, uh, um, it's been one of the joys of my life to work on this story and to continue to spread um, the, his tale. And, and it's, I found it uh, in February of 2006 on arguably the worst day of my life. I, my little brother and best friend had drunk himself to death. Um, I'd written a book that tanked in the United States and my wife and I were involved in this long lingering business dispute that took me to the brink of personal bankruptcy. And it was a snowy Saturday afternoon and I was uh, driving to Costco of all places in a snowstorm and I realized that I was worth more dead than alive. And I seriously considered driving into a bridge abutment so my wife and kids could collect on the insurance. Um, I didn't do it. I, I love my wife and kids. Uh, but I got to that Costco as rattled as I've ever been in my life. And I put my head on the steering wheel and I literally begged God in the universe for a story, something to give me purpose and meaning. And, uh, you know, I went into Costco. I, I did the shopping. I went home. My wife wasn't feeling well. She had a stomach flu. And she said, you got to go to the Robinsons, these friends of ours, for a dinner party. And I said, I'm not going to any dinner party. She said, you have to. We've canceled three times. Go for an hour. Excuse yourself uh, if you don't feel like it after an hour and come home. So I go and not 15 minutes into this dinner party, a perfect stranger starts telling me the story of Pino Lella. And I'm like, uh, first of all, I, I was highly skeptical. Um, I said, we would have heard this story before about a 17 year old boy who leads Jews escaping Nazi occupied Italy. And then through a series of remarkable circumstances becomes a spy inside the German high command. And he said, well, I, he's alive. You can talk to him. And I was like, alive? I mean, how old is he? And he was like 78. And I was like, okay. And uh, I went home and I walked into the house and my wife's looking like, what's with you, right? Because I walked out of there with my head down and feeling miserable. And, and I, I looked at her and I said, well, I don't know, but if it's true, I just heard the best untold story I've ever heard. And I think I'm going to go to Italy with the last of our money and chase the 60 year old war story. And my wife being my wife, uh, she said, well, of course you are. And uh, next day I got in touch with um, Robert Dalendorf, who the book's dedicated to, who had actually heard you know, much of the story before I did. Um, Bob, interesting guy. He uh, did very well on Wall Street as a young man and went on to lead a fascinating life. Among other things, he owned a ranch where the Horse Whisperer movie was shot, which is like one of the most beautiful places in the world. And um, Bob put me in touch with Michael Lella, who was Pino's son. And Michael put me in touch with Pino. And, you know, I said, I'd love to come to Italy to talk to you about the story. And he said, well, why would you want to do that? And I said, well, because you're, you're a hero. And he said, I'm no hero. I'm more of a coward. And, you know, now all of a sudden all my story instincts are going off. And um, six weeks later, I get off a plane in Milan and there's this big strapping guy waiting for me. And he's very genial, friendly, um, speaks beautiful English. Uh, we go and get in this little Citroën de chevaux, which is a, almost like a, you know, Volkswagen bug. And he proceeds to drive this thing like a Ferrari through the streets of Italy. And I'm like, you know, I've never met the guy before and I'm horrified. And I don't understand at this point how important his driving skills are going to be to the story. Um, so we go on this three week odyssey together where he and I force him to dig up the story out of his brain because he had blocked so much of it. And um, I at times felt cruel at what I had to do to get him to talk about it. Um, but as, as we talked and we spoke, you know, he, his own experiences of grief and life and his philosophy about how you carry on changed me. And I came back from Italy um, a totally different person. I basically, and I had this crazy idea, I want to tell a story to as many people as possible, because if it could change me, it, I was convinced it could change others. So I'd like to show you a little bit a uh, presentation of, of the, the actual facts and, and the history behind the story. So you kind of get it. I'm, 
I'm, I'm new to the share screen thing, but I'm gonna give it my best shot. And I'm gonna disappear for a bit here. So there's the book. Um, this is a picture of Pino uh, just before the story starts. This was taken on the 6th of June. The book starts around the 11th. So that's really what he looked like. Um, at the time, of course, Mussolini is starting to lose his power. Uh, he uh, has uh, tried to match Hitler and his invasions and he's lost in North Africa and the allies are poised off Sicily. And um, a little background, you know, until Mussolini himself was arguably uh, uh, not anti-Semitic. He, he, he didn't care. Jews had been largely assimilated in Italy for a close to 2000 years, but he's getting a lot of pressure and they pass these laws in 37 and they begin to enforce them in 38 uh, and 39. Um, and Pino, his family, uh, this is where they lived in, in the center of Milan to give you an idea of, of what his world looks like. Um, in the center, you'll see La Scala. Uh, there's the, um, uh, the Duomo and all the, he lives right in this central area. Um, this is the Duomo, which is one of the more remarkable structures I've ever seen. It took like 500 years to build. And as, this, as, the, as the story starts, um, everybody knows that uh, the allies have figured out that Hitler has lost his industrial base uh, in by the time 1943. And they believe the allies are gonna start bombing the cities of Milan uh, and Genoa. And um, they are attacking the industrial base that Hitler has left to him. And so the Cardinal Milan, uh, he puts uh, all these big spotlights on the uh, cathedral because they're gonna start going into blackouts. Um, this is the uh, Lella family, uh, Don Michele, Porgia, uh, Pino, they're all wearing what they call the Alpini hats here, which is indicative of Northern Italy. We don't have um, photographs of Uncle Albert and um, his wife, uh, but so here's the dad. He was, uh, he was the business brains behind the family business, which was to make purses. They were uh, heavily involved in the fashion industry and continued to be. He really didn't care for business. His whole dream was to be a musician. He was friends with many of the musicians in La Scala. Um, unfortunately, he, he, he wasn't a very good violinist. He loved it, but he just, he would constantly squall and stuff. Um, Porgia was the creative and artistic power behind the purse company. Uh, she was a real dynamo. She ends up being a big force in bringing Milan to the front in fashion in the post-war. Um, this is the back room of the luggage shop, which is uh, you know a big part of the story. Um, these are people who you can see all the luggage in the back. And there was actually, this is the back where they would have been sewing them and putting them together. Um, so the bombing begins on, on in June of 1943 and uh, Pino is out uh, as in, in the book, he goes to see a movie with Rita Hayworth and um, he gets stood up by uh, a woman in, in the book, it's Anna, in reality, it was another woman, but it made sense to make Anna part of this. Um, and they get bombed and, and Mimo's there and they literally have to run through the city in blackout um, toward the cathedral that night. Um, this is some of the pictures of the devastation, the bombardment, this is actually right near La Scala, which gets hit later in the summer. Um, Milan, about a third of all the buildings in Milan are destroyed in the next two years of the war. Um, that's the Galleria, if you've ever been there, um, they bombed the superstructure. Uh, I've always loved this picture of, of Mussolini. Whenever I had to write him, I would stare at it and, and tap into my own inner Mussolini to write about him. Um, in, in September of 43, a number of things happened. By then, the allies have attacked and um, the king of uh, Italy, he arrests Mussolini and tries to forge a truce. And uh, they put him in this fortress on Gran Sasso, which is north of Rome. And uh, which is Italy surrenders, Southern Italy surrenders. 
And um, Hitler, when he finds out that Mussolini has been put in Grand Sasso is infuriated. And he decides to send in commandos along with his top assassin to rescue him. And they go in by glider because they don't want any noise. Uh, they land, uh, this is uh, Otto Harold Moores. He was Hitler's top assassin and he leads the, the crew to rescue them. Um, here they are taking him across. He flies him straight to Berlin and um, they go on the radio and they announce that they're gonna fight to the last drop of Italian and German blood. And at the same time, this is going on, the, uh, he's sending divisions into Italy to begin to fortify it. Uh, they, they create a series of lines across Italy, of course, is long peninsula. It wasn't that difficult to create these battle lines, uh, the most famous of which was at Monte Cassino. Um, and what he does is Hitler supports uh, Mussolini in the creation of a puppet government called Salo. It's uh, on Lake Garda. And um, at the same time, they sent Walter Ralph, uh, the head of the SS in Northern Italy into um, uh, they send him into Northern Italy to take over. And Ralph is a uh, truly evil man. He was um, the architect or the designer of the portable gas chamber that was used in uh, Eastern Europe uh, in, from 41 on after the invasion of Russia. It starts out as the Holocaust of bullets, which is the subject of my new book. And, um, but he figures out that it's easier to use these big gas chambers. Um, so right around September 8th, when the, the Republic is formed uh, of Salo, uh, a lot of Jews have already figured out that this is gonna be bad news and they're moving north. And um, about 50 of them go into this place, the, the Hotel Mena, which no longer exists. This has existed when I, first started doing my research and I can tell you it was the creepiest place I've ever been in my life. Um, it had an energy with it that was incredibly oppressive. Um, anyway, this sits right on Lake Maggiore. And um, what happened is in, in like the 11th of September, um, Ralph finds out that the Jews are there and he sends um, SS troops to the hotel. Um, there's one girl uh, her name is Becky Bahar, and she goes north on a bicycle ride. And she comes back down the shore and she sees the SS forcing the, the 50 Jews into the water where they machine gun them. And she sees her whole family shot to death out in the water. And she tries to ride and a Catholic woman comes out and grabs her and brings her and saves her. I was able to um, interview uh, Becky Bahar and it was, uh, it was pretty emotional in her describing the whole thing. Um, this is an actual picture of the Panzer tanks that come onto the Duomo Plaza. They were there uh, until three days before the end of the war. Um, in October, uh, the Waffen SS starts uh, rounding up the Jews in Rome. Uh, and if you haven't read about that, there's a really great book coming out by Lisa Scottolini called Eternal, which is about uh, what happens in Rome in, in 43 and 44. Um, these are pictures, uh, for those of you who've read the book, um, these are the, the red cattle cars that are going north. Um, so where does Pino learn to drive? It, it turns out that he was taught by Alberto Ascari, who became twice the Formula One world champion and taught Pino everything that he knew about driving. And, and again, I can attest to his driving skills having been there. So as the bombardment increases, um, Mimo is sent north to Casal Pino, which was originally a Catholic boys school uh, camp. And eventually because of the bombardment, it becomes a school where the wealthy of Milan who were able to sent their children. And uh, Mimo goes first, and it isn't until the Lella's uh, apartment building, which is on Via Monte Napoleone, which is like the absolute center of the um, uh, fashion industry, uh, he Pino gets sent up there. Um, this is Father Don Luigi Bray, uh, uh, interesting character. He 
is um, not only uh, a, a very principled person, um, but he also uh, is a uh, what we would call a modern day helicopter parents nightmare. Um, he believed in sending boys into the mountains alone. Uh, he would give them what they needed, but he believed in making them self-sufficient and tough. And he believed that the mountains were one of the best places you could do that. Um, this is Father Ray and Giovanni Barbareschi, Father Barbareschi. Uh, at this point, he's still a seminarian, uh, but he goes up to Casalpina in the summers to help. And that summer, he's the one who originally comes up with the idea. And there are a group of, of Jews that go to Casalpina and they're asking to get to Switzerland, which is, I'll show you the maps and how it works, but they go over the top and he comes up with the idea of taking all the boys for a hike. There's 30 of them at the time. And they add in um, this small family of, of Jews and away they go on a picnic. And they end up, um, by the way, if they did this, they were caught, they, were, they would have been shot themselves. And they go over the top of this thing, the angel step is a three dimensional version of it. And going left to right, I, I don't know if you can see my hand, but you're gonna come over and you're gonna go up over the top of it. And when they got into Valdele, so if you look in the center left, you can see this big sort of spear shaped lake and that's Valdele. And way over at the other side, there's Interfera. Um, that's the trail down to Interfera. And so what they did is they had the picnic and as people would go into the woods to you know, use the bathroom, um, they would just start disappearing down the other side into Switzerland. Now they realized that they couldn't do this over and over again, that the Germans would start to get wise to it. Um, at the time, uh, and I, I know this is controversial, but this is coming from uh, Pino and a number of other people who were involved in this, they're told by Cardinal Schuster that um, the Pope has told them to save everybody, save everybody they can. And um, Schuster, was a, a very formidable personality. He uh, had to juggle all sorts of things in Milan, um, not only helping to uh, save the Jews of Northern Italy, but to save the town of Milan because eventually Hitler wants it destroyed, um, but he refuses. So um, Barbareschi forms Oscar in uh, September of 43 because he realizes this is gonna be a big deal. And don't ask me to uh, pronounce the Italian words because I can't speak Italian very well. Uh, but it basically was Catholic scouts working to aid refugees. And what they did was um, there was a group uh, called the Aguiles Rondages. It means the Wandering Eagles. It was equivalent of our Boy Scouts. And Barbareschi had been heavily involved in this as a child. And Mussolini had outlawed the scouts about nine years before the story opens because he didn't like the fact that they were up in the, in the mountains and he couldn't monitor them and they were learning how to use guns. Um, so Barbareski realizes the big thing is he's gonna have to control um, documents. So he starts a forgery operation and I was um, blessed to be able to interview Barbareski and actually he had all his forging tools still with him. Um, uh, admittedly, Moda was not the most important route out Val Cordera was. Um, it was much more remote. It's north uh, east of Lake Como and Medesimo and Moda are slightly north northwest. Um, but they would go over the top of the ridge you can see at the far right. Uh, and it was it was a brutal climb. Um, these are pictures of some of the refugees going up and over. Uh, so he, what he did was uh, Barbareschi was the brains of this uh, in, in, in Rome, and he would send the documents up. And if they were going to uh, the Splugen, they would go to Valciavenna, um, up the Splugen drainage to Campotocino, and then they would take them in ox carts and they would cover them with hay as they were going up the mountain so they couldn't be seen. And they would stage at Casalpina. And um, then over the course of that winter, these were the escape routes. So the first one is the lower one. That would be the angel step. Um, then as, as snow built in the lower part, they couldn't get through and it was difficult. So they started using two other routes, the north route, which is the upper one. Um, and then the, the hard way, which is described in the, um, in the book. 
Um, all of these were rigorous. You know, it, it looks like it's not that far and probably as the crow fly, it's not, but it's tough. So here are boys uh, in the spring of 44 at Casalpina out on the terrace. That's the mountains behind them. <clears throat> That's Pino on the right, uh, leading uh, Jewish refugees in the spring of 44. Um, this is Pino himself, and I'm gonna see if this will work for you, but he is standing uh, on the original site of the, the chapel that's described in the book. And that's Campo Docino far below him. And let's see if he'll talk to us. Signaling from the house, yes. Uh, always from the house here and from down below, actually in, in uh, Campo Dolcino and slightly up above. Yeah, he was describing, I, I missed it, but he was describing how they use the lanterns. Um, so uh, these are variations of the north route. And what I learned very early uh, in my uh, interviewing with him was that he tended to downplay things, especially his role and stuff. So his, uh, he argued that uh, any, when we got to Campo de Chino and I saw the vertical rise that it was going to have to go on, he said, well, any competent alpinist could have done this. Well, I, I am a competent alpinist and I was like shocked because of course, I'm going to show you, uh, this will give you an idea of how steep this is. It's like an ox cart up these switchback roads. They're going up that, right? This is brutal terrain. And this over here, we're getting into uh, uh, the hard way. Now these are, they're now chairlifts. There are no chairlifts back then. So this is, um, that right there is the position of uh, Casalpino. Th that is the new Casalpino. This is a hotel now. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm about a, maybe a quarter of the way up the route, the hard way at this point. And I'm gonna turn the camera around so you can look up and then I'm gonna, you're gonna jump and I'm gonna be at the top and you're gonna look down. And I want you to remember this, they climbed it he led people who had no alpine experience, many of them in street shoes, and they started at night. So I'm going to go back. Hold on. Uh, how do I do that? So again, I'm looking downhill, and now I'm going to turn it, and you're going to come around and pop that spine up, up, up up all the way to that peak. And now you're gonna look down and think about that. They climbed it in street shoes in the snow at night. Um, this is a picture of where Pino skied uh, the woman down on his back. That's Valdele, that's the frozen lake below. Um, and it gives you an idea of, of what he had to do. Um, at the same time, the fighting in Italy is fierce. Now this is the winter of 43, 44. And the allies get bogged down at Monte Cassino, um, which if the, for those of you who don't know, it was a monastery on the top and the Germans took it and they put their artillery up there because they knew there was a narrow uh, valley that the allies had to go up and they, bomb, they would bombard it. Um, late April 44, Pino's life changes. His parents are very concerned that it, he's about to turn 18, he's gonna be drafted uh, and uh, Italians are either being sent to Germany to work as slaves in their factories or they're being thrown onto the front. Um, SS comes to Casalpina in uh, the spring of 44 uh, and the Gestapo goes through the place and they see how Spartan a life that Father Ray lives. And at the same time this happens, uh, you'll see in the book, uh, true story that um, they were scared because there were Jews in Casalpina at the time and there were oxen and Pino took them into the snow and they had them climb trees and they drove oxen through the trees to destroy all the um, uh, trails. And so in the, he goes back and they convince him that he's going to join um, the least known part of the Nazi war machine, which is the organization Tote. These were posters that were um, uh, used to try to uh, recruit them to it. And so Pino in 44 is forced to join the organization Tote and do the most hated thing he does in his life, which is to wear this uh, swastika on his arm. Um, the organization Tote 
as I say in the book, like Pharaoh's before him, I could never figure out how did Hitler build all these fortifications in France and in Italy and in other places so fast. And it was because he took slaves. So every time they would invade a country, they would take all able-bodied men over the age of 16 and enslave them. They built everything from tank, tag, tank, uh, tank traps. Uh, this is an idea of organization toe drilling. Um, uh, so this is an incredible thing. He comes and he gets wounded, right? He's, he's in a, he put in the, in the uh, um, railroad station in Monza and it gets bombed and he gets wounded and, and his two fingers almost get severed. And he's, he's, he gets a brain injury, obviously, uh, from the bombardment. And they don't know this at the time, but um, his fingers almost get caught off and he, he gets them sewn back on and they send him home for 10 days to convalesce. And he goes home and he's, his parents aren't there and he goes to uh, Uncle Albert's um, luggage store and there's a, a staff car, Nazi staff car sitting out front, the hood's up, the guy's under it working. And Pino has been learning all about engines from Alberto Ascari and he goes in and as it's depicted in the story, he gets the carburetor to work correctly and he shuts it and there's Layers standing there. And Layers recruits him and uh, layers and the Germans use about 15 to 17,000 laborers to build the Gothic line across the Northern Apennine Mountains, which is north of, of Rome. And um, they build all sorts of bunkers and fortified guns nests and casements and um, anything that they needed layers was really responsible for. Um, this gives you an idea of the gray men. This is actually a propaganda picture because they don't look that bad. Um, especially these guys. These guys look almost plump. Um, they were not. They were, this was a total propaganda thing to show that um, they were, uh, they were told that they were just fine and they weren't. Um, this is the extent of these fortifications. This would have been down um, on the Apennine line, the Gothic line. Um, these are just examples of other things that they were building. And now he knows going with layers and he's seeing the position of all these things. And he's starting to feed the information to Uncle Albert. Um, they do it through this uh, uh, OSS radio, which um, you don't see it there, but there was a, a false top on it. And there's a, a, a scene that people love in it when they smuggle this radio, because uh, they were radio hunters, right? If, if any of you have read um, All the Light We Cannot See, they talk about the radio hunters. Uh, this is true in Milan too. And they would use triangulation. And so, um, they took all, they threw the, uh, after the Lela's got a new home, um, a dentist lived below them and they, the Nazis came and threw them out. And that was where the VIP stayed and it had its own shortwave. And there was an antenna right on the Lela's roof. And they came up with the audacious idea of tying into the Nazis antenna because they would figure that when the, when the, um, uh, uh, radio hunters came in triangulation, they would say, well, it's someone, a VAP, basically radioing Berlin. <coughs> Spies were caught, were shot on the spot. Um, in June of, of uh, 1944, uh, they, Mar General Mark Clark in the Fifth Army uh, takes Rome. But at, just before this happens, uh, Eisenhower has pulled all sorts of divisions out for D-Day and the war in uh, Italy kind of grounds to a halt by September. They only get about 16 miles north of, of Rome before the winter sets in. And it's one of the most brutal winters on record. And so you have both the allies and the Germans suffering. The Germans are higher on the mountains and they're just as, it's just as brutal for them. Um, this is where the 10th Mountain Division was active. Uh, these are Germans. They suffered just as much. The spring of 40, 45, uh, finally they break through at Monte Cassino and they're heading north, they're driving north. And you can see from the pictures that um, Mussolini is, the pressure is getting to him and he's starting to go mad basically. And he's losing all sorts of weight and um, it gets to be the end of the war. And as I've described him in, on April 25th, 45 is when he arrests layers and delivers them to the partisans. And this was one of the moments that I, when I heard about it, I just loved reading about it was 
that right around midnight on this night, for the first time in more than two years, the lights go on and people are dancing in the street, even though it's still really dangerous and they're shooting and everything. And um, it's a time of incredible joy and the partisans start to come in. Um, these are Alpini partisans. And this shows you how young they really were. Uh, Mimo was 15 and 16 uh, and he was a ferocious fighter. Um, women were part of the fight too to drive the Nazis out. Um, but, uh, and this is an interesting thing, that they, there were a lot of vendetta killings right in the last five to six, seven days of war, especially um, collaborators and um, they weren't, they were taken out and killed. There was a lot of it. Um, they were hung, shot. Um, this is Mussolini's last day. Uh, they bring him, of course, into the Piazzella Loretto uh, hang him upside down where uh, there's a scene of absolute savagery that ends up haunting the Italians for years. Um, this is where the, the book uh, climaxes uh, in the um, Dolomite Mountains of Northern Italy. Um, so how many were saved? Uh, you know, according to the records I've been able to find, Val Codera Oscar and the Achille Randage were able to get 2,166 Jews over the top of the Alps into Switzerland to safety. Um, Moda Valle, Father Ray, Oscar, and the boys of Caz Alpina, there were hundreds of Jews downed out Allied pilots. It became a way station for um, the OSS to get out in and out of Italy as well. Um, this is uh, Father Ray's uh, page or description in a book called The Righteous of Italy. Um, it's it's fairly odd. People always ask me, why, isn't, why aren't these people in Yad Vashem? And it's interesting. I always thought that Yad Vashem was the number one place to find information. And it's not true. I think the U.S. Um, Holocaust uh, Museum is the best place because they had no idea about Oscar when I went and talked to them. And, and they were sort of stunned at the number of people who had gotten out. Um, Father uh, Barbareski and Father Ray are both in Gardens of the Righteous in Milan. Um, this is the Golden Madonna. That is Father Ray's uh, crypt, which is above Casalpina. And no one knows where the gold came from, but it was evidently paid for by all the people that he had saved. Um, there's uh, Father Barbareski with his most treasured thing. It was a certificate of merit from the Israeli community of Milan, declaring him one of the righteous of Italy. Um, that's Cardinal Schuster's tomb below the Duomo, which you can go see. Um, that's modern Casalpina. It shows you the ruggedness of the mountains and the snow depths. Um, this is Hans Leyer's later in life. Uh, this is uh, his home, the estate that he went to after the war and that he, um, it was ironically burned uh, in part by uh, escaped organization tote slaves it was a total coincidence. I don't think they knew he was there, right? but they burned it. And um, about three years after the war, his money gets released. It was frozen uh, while he was in prisoner war camp awaiting um, trial and he gets released and he comes back and he rebuilds the estate and um, he becomes a benefactor to the town with all the money he has and he builds that church. Uh, that they named the road after him after, since the book has been published, the city voted to not to rename the road, um, to not glorify him. Uh, there I am with Pino, he's 78. I mean, he look, looks unbelievable. Um, there I am at the German War Archives in Berlin. Uh, and there's one of the proudest moments of my life, bringing the book to him after 10 years. Um, there he is on Lake Orta with me. In June of 17, shortly after the book came out, he is uh, 89 years old there. And that's a picture that I took of the Duomo with the Scarlet Sky. And that's the book. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the main presentation. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, I'll tell you if I can't answer it. Um, so, but, um Mark, thank you so much. And um, and I know certainly uh, for any of us, as we read a book, there are images that that our minds create, but being able to actually see these images is really 
amazing as well. And uh, and putting faces with the names and the the actual people. Yeah. Um, and that actually is one of the one of the questions that uh, that someone asked was, how did you get all of these pictures, uh, and and where did you find all of this information? Uh, I found some of the pictures in the war archives. Um, I found uh, both in Italy, uh, sorry, all, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, and the U.S. war archives is where I did research. The picture of um, the suitcase radio. Uh, you know, Pino had described it to me, and I was in the U.S. archives researching the OSS in Italy, and I turned a page, and there was a photograph, and I go, it, it's exactly the way he described it, so I was blown away by that, and um, again and again, all these little things that he would say would, you know, kind of be corroborated as I went. Um, he helped me, you know, figure out the, the routes on the maps, um, Layers, I was able to finally track down and I was able to, to talk to his, uh, his daughter um, briefly. Uh, she was very sick at the time. Uh, she was able to confirm that he was being held uh, for war crimes at Nuremberg. And then, of course, most of the Italian uh, war criminals were let go. Uh, there were some that were tried, but many of them were let go. And so the reason is why, and it was time. People were sick of the war. People were sick of the retributions of the war. And also, um, there was just this idea that it was enough. And as a result, a lot of people got away with stuff in Italy. They walked away, including Layers. I mean, he was just let go. And um, Layers, another one of the things that was interesting was, I remember Pino telling me that Layers had told him that he, he did well before Adolf Hitler, he did well during, and he would do well afterwards. And when I interviewed his minister and his aide, they said the same thing, um, which was, was kind of mind blowing. You hear it from two different people at, 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 you know, in wildly different parts of this guy's life said the same thing. And, I, and that's actually, you know, it's one of the questions that you and I had had talked about was uh, th that exact question. And, and what did Pino think? Did he think layers was good or bad? And yes, what do you think from from what you've seen, what you've read, what you've heard? Yeah, well, I I think he's aptly named. He had layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And I don't think you can peg him as good or bad. Uh, he was both. He, I think he really was an opportunist, right? He was the kind of guy, I remember his comment in the book, he says, I like to be the person behind the scenes pulling the levers. I don't wanna be out front. Um, and he did that his, his entire life. I think he was the kind of guy who understood that power was best yielded in the shadows. And um, Pino said that there were parts of him that were, you know, you, you could see him as being a very good person. He did rescue Jews. Uh, uh, at one point, the book was 850 pages long and oh, like no God. one was going to read it. Right. And so I had to figure out what am I going to cut? And it, it became the filter became was Pino there. Right. Mm -hmm. And if Pino wasn't there, it didn't get in. So, um, for example, I know that Layers also saved a guy who was a uh, a musician, a conductor in Venice, but it didn't get into the book um, just because Pino wasn't there. He also built a thing called Marnate's Bunker, which was shortly before Pino meets him. And that's where all the gold of Italy was held. Um, and eventually Mussolini gets it moved, but they don't know how much was moved and how much went to him. Um, the book also had a, a long description of how Barbareski set up the smuggling and the the forgery operation, but stuff had to end up on the editing room floor, floor and that did. Mm. Um, what, one other question that uh, that was inspired by the presentation, and then we'll, we'll go uh, take a step back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, how did Pino become fluent in both French and Italian? I mean, my, my guess is because of where he was located. I don't know if that's common in Milan or if that has to do with the fashion industry or, or what. But Manny. He had nanny. two different nannies. He had a British <laughs> nanny and a French nanny. And so he was raised trilingual. Um, okay. And, you know, which was greatly to my benefit. It, it also helped that he had lived in uh, Mammoth Lakes and Beverly Hills for like 30 years. So mm -hmm. spoke great English. Right, right. Yeah. So, so let's um, uh, take a step back just a little bit, which is um, really looking at the, the focus of, of your book. It, it sheds light on Nazi-occupied Italy and 
Um, and the question is, why do you suppose so few books have been written about that time and place? Many of the books that are written yeah. in Germany or other places as well, but not Italy. Yeah, you get to see, you know, all you have to do is go into a library, right? And you can see shelf upon shelf about the war in France, about the war in Germany, about the war in the northern countries. But there's there's little. I mean, it's there, but it's not to anywhere near the extent. And I, I was trying to figure out why. And so I was able to interview uh, some of the surviving partisans. And uh, they, too, never talked about it. And I said, well, what was it? And they said it was seeing the level of savagery that existed inter-Italian in the last five days of the war and about four or five days afterwards. Um, there were vendetta killings anywhere. I've seen estimates as high as 30,000 people died in like eight days. Uh, most of them were fascist collaborators or perceived as fascist collaborators and were just shot and left in the streets. They were in Milan, they were picking up anywhere between 500 to 800 bodies a night in that last five, six days of the war and afterwards. And they were horrified by, and, 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 and including the desecration of Mussolini. And they were also horrified by it, and they were young. You gotta also remember that, they're very young. And a big portion of their life has been taken up by the war and they just wanted to move on. And so they buried it. And to the extent that I was like shocked, one of the people that I interviewed, um, uh, Penzini, he's a friend of Mimo's. Uh, he had fought with Mimo. He was asked to come to a local high school in Milan and talk about the war. And when he started explaining what had happened in Italy, the children laughed at him. They said it wasn't true. And, and they said it wasn't true because they had never heard it. And I realized that, you know, one of the things about it was that if you don't remember, if you don't talk about it, the world forgets and then it can be repeated. And um, that was shocking to me, right? That, that they had just, and I understood it, they had been in so much pain that they wanted to forget about it. Um, but now it's coming out. I mean, and this book has done a lot to um, help people understand what happened in the war. And why, why a novel versus straight nonfiction? I mean, you yeah. have, certainly have all that information. I had a lot of it, but, uh, about four years into it, hey, hey, I started out with a bunch of weaknesses, right? I don't speak German, I don't speak Italian. I do speak French, but I don't speak those two languages. And um, so I had to hire translators whenever I would go to Italy or Germany to help me do archival work. And um, there were holes in the story. I could just see them. I didn't understand why certain things happened. And I went to a, um, a party, cocktail party in publishing in New York um, about four and a half years uh, into this process. And I ran into an agent that I'd known for years who wasn't an agent, of my agent anyway. And she said, uh, I was explaining my frustration. And she said, well, Mark, you know, if this book had come to you 20 years ago, when you were an uh, investigative journalist, I would say tough, you know, you got to just keep grinding at it. But he said, it didn't come, you came to a novelist. And there's something an, a novelist can do that even the best nonfiction writers can't do. And that's bringing the story to life. That is to make the reader experience the story as the character did. And I, you know, thought about that for a couple of years. And then I, I realized that she was right, that the real important thing was not to get every fact perfect and in place, but to tell the emotional arc of what Pino Lello went through. And so I wanted the readers to go through that same emotional journey. That that I ended up going through when I heard um, when I heard the story, so that became my compass when I was writing the book. Um, and again, as I said, I had to filter out stuff that Pino you know wasn't part of uh, because I wanted the, the the camera lens, as it were, to be closely focused on him. So a couple related questions: one, uh, because it's a novel, not all the characters are, are perhaps were actual. Uh, real life people yeah. was was Anna or Anna was she real? She's real, yeah. She was real. Um, she was Dolly's maid. Uh, Pino, they did have a love affair. Um, it was uh, she did get shot. Uh, Dolly did get shot. Um, it's debatable whether it happened exactly like that because the first time he told me the story, which was like near the it was probably the Monday of the third week, and um, the way he told it the first time was that. 
uh, he went back to Dolly's apartment to try to see what Layer's documents that he, these papers that he wanted to get the night that he arrested him. And the original way he tells me is the, the concierge, the woman with the Coke bottle glasses, she tells him that they were taken out and shot. And it, when Pino told the story the first time, it devastated him, right? I mean, he was just, he couldn't go on talking about it. He was really rattled. And he asked if we could stop for the day. And um, I didn't want to eat. I went out that night. I came down. At that night, it started to rain. And I was living on the third floor of his villa. And I could hear him playing piano. And I went out and I was listening. It was very dark. And I'm not a big music person. So I, I don't know what he was playing. But it was dark and disturbing. And I went down the next morning. And he was still sitting at the piano when I walked into his apartment and I said, Pino, and he, he jumped and turned around. He had eyes as big as saucers. And um, I said, he, he said, oh, and so the same day, he was all distracted that second day and uh, asked to stop again. And when I came down the third, the next morning, the only way I can describe him is he was ruined. I mean, he just looked like a shell. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I haven't slept in about, 50 hours and you know beyond an hour and when I do I have this nightmare over and over and over again and the nightmare version of what happens is what you get in a novel because I think it's closer to the truth hmm. um, the end of the book and hopefully um no I don't think spoilers but uh but there are some threads that are left hanging for the yeah. reader and uh such as how did Layers know that Pino was a spy and was that intentional? Uh, well, that's, that's actually the most common question I get asked. How did he know? And we don't know. Um, there are all sorts of theories that I get, I, that I had myself, but I also get others from readers who have some, a lady suggested out of the blue that Anna was the one who fingered them. And I was like shocked at that. Uh, but it kind of made sense in one sense that she'd seen him trying to find the key and um, she may have turned him in and Layers, being the opportunist that he was, realized that he had a unique opportunity to feather his own nest, as it were. And um, so we don't know. It could have been Knievel, the American, um, that you know, all of a sudden says he's a hero. Uh, Knievel could have told him, um, but there, you know, there are five or six ways that it could have happened. And I think it's interesting because it's more like life, right? Life isn't neat and tied up. Um, and it leads to a lot of discussion. Was Layers a good person? Was he a bad person? You know, where did he fit? And um, I just think that those kinds of stories and where the threads are left are A, more like life and B, they, they lead to a lot of intense discussion. And what, one of the questions asked in the chat that I think many of us wonder, uh, did they, did Pino see layers after the war? Never. No, never again. The scene where he goes off the head of the past is the last time he sees him. Mm -hmm. He had no idea what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was able to give him some closure when I was able to talk to his daughter and his minister and his aide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and did Pino ever reunite with anyone he rescued? I believe he did. Um, you got to understand that one of the things I try to explain to people is, again, the book was 850 pages long, but beyond that, you know, he led, you know, according to his account, more than 30 of these escapes. And I couldn't tell the story of 30 escapes. It would have been just jaw droppingly boring after, you know, the first one. So being a novelist and a dramatist, I took the best parts of the escapes and put them all together. So um, did people go up the hard way? Yes. Um, did they risk their lives? Yes. Um, was there an avalanche where they were in, in one of the huts? Yes. Did they have to dig their way out? Yes. Was there a violinist? Yes. Was there a pregnant woman? Yes. Did Pino ski a woman down on his back? Yes. Were they all the same person? No. That's a dramatic effect. I did it so you would understand what he had, the extent of what he had done without going into the nitty gritty, which would have bogged the story down. Seems even more dramatic, separating all of those out and thinking about each journey being, in some ways, like that one harrowing journey. Right, right. Um, they so, all had elements of it. I mean, and the right. other one was, people asked me, was there really a grenade put in the, one of the stoves? Yes, it mm -hmm. blew up. Did, did was there a grenade that blew up in the town of Medesimo and took one kid's eyes and one kid's hands and killed a third? Yes. 
I was able to interview the blind guy. So yes, um, the but some people would go, well, why fiction? And you know, I had to recreate discussions from sixty-five years before, and you know, no no one has that kind of memory for it. So by the by the fact that I dramatized it, it's fiction, but it's fiction largely based on fact. And, and as we know, fiction carries a, a message as well. And, and as readers, we take a message away, but I, I'm curious, I'm sure many of us are, what is the novel's message? The novel's message is that human beings are capable of remarkable courage and altruism. And that, you know, when it comes right down to it, uh, as bad as our existence might be on a daily basis, it's still a miracle. Um, one of the books that's had just a profound effect on me is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And so much of, of what Pino talked about just echoed Frankl, you know, and in his own way. And it, it really made me appreciate everything I've been given. I mean, when, when I heard this story, I was just, it was the worst moment of my life. And I still get emotional to, to think that I was given the story, you know, and uh, how much it meant to me and how much it's meant to other people. You know, I, people ask me all the time, what, what's the best part of this, Mark, right? Because, you know, I was down on my luck. I was, you know, arguably finished as a writer and when this story came to me and um, they'll say, you know, 37 languages there you know, it's close to 3 million people have read the book uh, they're doing a seven part mini series about it and I say all those things are just unbelievably fantastic and I wouldn't trade them for anything but the, the thing that means the most are these letters that I get from people who were either profoundly um, depressed and many of them suicidal when they picked up the book and they write me how it changed their lives. And there's nothing that I've done that's ever been more fulfilling than that. Sorry, having my own technology issue here. No worries. Um, apologies. Uh, thank you for sharing that because I, I know that um, when you talk about being grateful for the miracle of every moment, um, it's, it's sometimes stepping into someone else's shoes and hearing, and you did over, over a length of time, but just the, the courage in, um, in the face of unbelievable challenge and, and life and death yeah. and recognizing to have the courage to, to continue forward and, and not only for yourself, but to help others uh, and, and enable others to be able to do that as well is just right. extraordinary. And I'm curious, uh, I, I um, and I, I see it, there are a couple other questions in the in the chat, but I I am curious uh, about about what you learned from from Pino, not just the message of the novel, but um, from connecting with him and having that that time with him. It must have had a profound impact. Well, it did. I mean, he was you know he he'd obviously dealt with grief a lot in his life, um, even though he's like one of the happiest people I've ever met, uh, just ever, uh, just. He's just thrilled to see everybody who comes his way, who just very gregarious and genteel. Uh, but, you know, he, when he's in the, in the last part of the book, he talks about um, that, you know, we never know who's going to come into our lives or leave it. And the trick, and that's not even a trick, it's a philosophy of just being grateful for having had them and, and to know that, that, everybody has an effect on everybody. And I was able to see my brother in a completely different way. It took me years to get there. But now when I look at my brother's death, I realized that in some ways it was a gift because I could not have understood grief and loss at the level that Pino felt unless I had experienced it myself. So would I trade the book for my brother? 100%. But there is good that came out of it. I was able to understand, as I say, grief and loss in a way that I would not have if my brother hadn't died the way he did. So um, that's primarily what I've learned. And that 
you know, the miracles in life are there if you look for them. You just got to look. And when you start looking for them, they appear everywhere. Uh, you know, and it, some of them are simple, you know, like snow falling in a forest. To me, that's a miracle. Um, and all these things. And it's, it's, it's largely what you focus your, your attention on. And he taught me that, you know, in, in a real concrete way. We, um, a couple of questions for the chat. I'm going to hold one of them uh, till the end, but um, but a couple related to what was going on perhaps in the U.S. and in other other places as well. Uh, uh, one of our participants shared that her father was in the U.S. consulate in mid-46, and what was the U.S. government's approach at that time uh, to, one, to Jews trying to get to Palestine, and two, how did the U.S. deal with the collaborators and war criminals? Boy, the um, U.S. didn't have the whole role, right? It was Nuremberg. That's where the focus was. Um, I didn't really get into the, the movement to Palestine, even though it was there. Um, I didn't. People ask my, me why I didn't deal with the Pope issue, and it's because it came down to Pino never met the Pope. You know, it was like the filter. I had to avoid it. And so did, did the Pope give a verbal order? You know, there are all sorts of scholars who will rage and say no, uh, but, you know, person after person after person that I contacted and talked to, they said that's why they did it, right? It's because it was, it was an oral thing that was given through the church. And the fact of the matter is that there was anywhere between, you know, depending on the estimates you look at, 49 and 51,000 Jews in Italy at the time of the invasion, and they found 8,000. Mm. What happened? The rest of them were hidden, saved. Uh, I, I'm sure people are aware that uh, there were hundreds of Jews that were hidden in the town of Assisi in uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi's actual monastery in the basement. Um, and it happened, there, there were even Jews hidden in the Vatican, you know. Uh, were there Catholic priests who turned in Jews? I'm sure, and there are evidences of it. But on the whole, something happened. You know, some, somebody gave an order, somebody said something, and they started reacting altruistically. They, it was evident, self-evident very quickly that if you were caught saving Jews, you would be killed. And yet they did it again and again and again and again and again. So um, yeah, it's a fascinating thing. I, I, I understood none of this when I started. And what, why do you think uh, the Lola family obviously had money? This is also, someone asked this as well. Why, why um, did they not send Pino and Mimo to the U.S. to avoid the war? I don't think you could have gotten to the U.S. at that point. Remember, that this book starts in 43. The war has already been going for, you know, our involvement was in 41, so two years into it. Um, and for a lot of them, they the war didn't affect them until 43, right? It was like they were just living their life. They, they were an arguably wealthy family. Um, they had no reason to get involved in this, in the resistance or you know, helping to save the Jews, and yet they did. Um, and I think that speaks to people's common humanity. Uh, and, and that's what I take from it, is that, you know, life is best lived when you're in service to others, I believe. And when it's not about yourself, when you're giving to others, that's when your life really begins. And that was another lesson I learned from Lola, you know, that he's just one of these guys who wants to give everything to everybody, you know, um, just, a remarkable person and I've seen in the chat is he still alive he is he's uh he'll be 93 uh, on June 1st um he's physically a machine uh you've never seen anybody that aged in that kind of physical shape or at least I haven't he still he was riding a mountain bike until last year uh he rides an e-bike now all over cobblestones um so he's physically hale healthy um, but he's 93, so he has, you know, he has good days and bad days mentally. Um, the last time I saw him, he didn't know me for 20 minutes, so. But then he remembered who I was. So. Um, someone suggested that we should take a, uh, a field trip. We should take a trip to, to Italy to see all these amazing sites. And perhaps, uh, perhaps that's something the empty nesters can plan for the future. Um, in the meantime, I know very excited about the mini series and uh, we'll have to regroup when um, when that comes out. But in the meantime, 
I know you have another book coming out soon and I'm very excited about it. Will you tell us a little, I know you have it there with you. You're going to show us and tell us a little bit about it. So it's called The Last Green Valley. And um, people you know, told me that I never find another story like Pino Lella's. And I went, I don't know, I think I, I will. And um, I was open to it. And sure enough, shortly after the book was published, all of a sudden I'm getting letters, you know, and emails and contacting my website, tell the story of my grandmother, tell me the story of this and this. And I realized very quickly, I was gonna have to have a filter, right? What was I gonna write next? And I went back and I really thought about Beneath the Scarlet Sky and why it had touched so many people all over the world. And I really believe that the story was inherently moving, inspirational, healing, and for many readers, transformational. And so that became my filter. I was looking for a story that inherently had that. And um, I'm reading all these things and they're close, but they're not quite what I'm looking for. And then I'm at a um, the ro noontime rotary in Bozeman, Montana, where I live, and I'm doing this same thing I just, presentation I did for you. And um, a dentist, retired dentist comes up to me afterwards and he says, have you ever heard the story of the Martells? And he goes, do you know who they are? And I go, you mean like the construction company? There's a big construction company based in Bozeman that does work all over the Northern Rockies and it's Martell Construction. And I said, no. And he said, well, the entire time I was reading your book, I, that's all I could think of was their story of how they came to America. So a couple of days later, I put Bill Martell's uh, you know, address in my nav and it's like two miles from where I live. And I drive down the hill and tells me to take a left in this neighborhood and I'm getting this really funky feeling and I can't figure it out. And then I get to Bill's driveway and I get out and I realize I'm not 200 yards from the dinner party where I heard Pino's story. Uh, and I go in and he starts telling me the story about how their family were ethnic Germans who lived in Ukraine and they'd been there for over a century uh, they'd gone at the behest and invitation of Catherine the Great, who realized that the key to keeping Russia fed was the fertile lands of the Ukraine. But the serfs who lived there were horrible at growing wheat and grain. So uh, Catherine the Great put out you know, a, a, an invitation to Germans who were willing to leave Germany, who were farmers, wheat farmers, and she would give them something like 80 to 125 hectares. And uh, they built colonies like in the 1790s to 1805 right there. And they lived largely in isolation for over a century, growing wheat, doing very well for themselves, but also providing food to Russia until the Bolshevik revolution. And they get thrown off their lands eventually and they starve. Um, Joseph Stalin starved the Ukrainians, killed 4 million people in about nine months. Um, and uh, afterwards, Adolf Hitler uh, invades uh, Russia uh, in Operation Barbarossa in June of uh, 1941. And um, first thing he does is, the reason Hitler invades is he wants those wheat fields because he, he has a plan for an expanding Germany and he wants to be able to feed them. So he goes to the ethnic Germans and says, you want your land back? And they're like, damn straight, we want our land back. Now you got to remember that they are, they lived in isolation. So they spoke German, but they, they had no relationship with German over a century. And um, so anyway, they get their land back and life's pretty good for about 18 months. And then Stalin counterattacks. And as the book opens, they have this horrible um, decision to make. Are they going to stay and wait for the Soviet bear to return? Or are they going to run with the wolves? because uh, the Nazis have promised to protect them because it turns out that Heinrich Himmler believed they were the last great repository of Aryan blood on earth. And I had no idea any of this was concerned, happened or concerned. And so imagine this, there's, there's an army attacking, there's an army leading, and there's 100,000 people in horse carts, horse and buggy carts, and they get caught between the two armies as they, go across Europe to try to get back to Germany. And the story, what unfolds is just extraordinary. Um, it, the, a lot of the book deals with the issue of the Holocaust of bullets um, because they were there when it happened. Um, it turned out after the fact that 
I was talking to one of Adeline Martell's, she's dead now, she was the mom. So this is mom, dad, two little boys are the heroes of the story. And um, after the fact, she, she said that when they got their farm back, um, they had to rebuild the house. So uh, Mr. Martell went to a place called Dubasari in um, what was then Transnistria. And uh, he comes back three days later, three days later than he should have. And he said he was um, forced to bury Jews. And so I started doing research and sure enough, like 18,000 Jews were killed at Dubasari in the Holocaust of bullets. And then I found out another thing in my research, which was that a lot of the excuses that people gave for participating in the Holocaust, which was they said that they would be shot if they would be killed themselves if they didn't participate. And that was fundamentally untrue because it turns out that before the Holocaust of bullets began, Heinrich Himmler actually watched um, uh, a firing squad kill political prisoners in Germany. And he was so disturbed that he, he vomited. And he said that I don't want anybody involved in the extermination of the Jews who aren't true believers. So no one shall be punished for refusing to kill a Jew. And I had no idea. And so that becomes part of the moral center of the story. Well, I know I, I for one, am looking forward to, to reading that as well. And perhaps we'll have a, be able to have another conversation a little bit farther down the line. Sure. Um, and uh, Mark, we are, are so grateful for your time today and, and um, not only for your, your research and, and your um, creative mind, but for your presence both today and, um, and really that blessing, uh, miracle of every moment, not just the miracle of this one and being able to, to share that. We have a, um, a prayer in, a, a blessing in Judaism that is a an opportunity to, to express gratitude and and in the translation it, it says we uh, blessed are you Adonai our God ruler of the universe for giving us life um, and that's the, the fact that we're all here together for sustaining us and we know that sometimes it takes a little bit more to sustain us and to get us through life's challenges and difficult moments and the mountains that we climb both physically as uh, as Pino did and and you as well um, and, uh, and allowing us and enabling us to reach this moment, which also takes courage in, in so many ways for each of us. And we want to thank you as well, not only for your words on the page, your words today, but also sharing so openly of yourself. And, um, and really, it, it's, uh, I've, I've read it twice already. I feel like I need to go and read a third time um, because I, I uh, just having had this time with you, Add so much and brings so much more to the story and um, to the perspective that that you brought to it. Um, and what a blessing, um, certainly for you to to have the relationship and spend the time with Pino. But what a blessing for him as well, in the gracious way that I'm sure, as you've been with us, in the gracious way I'm sure that you uh, shared and and gave him the space, and um, and the opportunity and the, the love that he needed in order to be able to share his story, which is, a, I'm sure, a, a challenging and difficult one to share. It was, I mean, I'll tell you one more thing, just one little thing is, so it was like two days before I was supposed to leave Italy and uh, Pino's ex-wife Yvonne, who's also his best friend and caretaker now, she took us out to dinner and Pino's in the front seat. And um, uh, as I said, he's normally gregarious and he's talking and, you know, and he was just sitting like this and she finally looks over and says, Pino, what's the matter? And, and he looked over and he said, what do you mean? He said, you're so quiet. And, and he said, well, Yvonne, you've known me for close to 33 years. How, how many times have you seen me cry? And she said, cry? I, I've never seen you cry. And he looked over his shoulder. I mean, he said, Mark, you've known me for less than three weeks. How many times have you seen me cry? I said, it's got to be more than 10. And she was so shocked. She almost crashed the car. And then she got really angry at me because I had heard a story that she had not. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just so grateful that he told it to me, you know. And I, I think it, it does take a special person to, um, to be able to, uh, to give someone and provide the space, a safe space in which they can tell the story. And, and sometimes it is easier 
when it's not someone who is as close, close. but but the relationship that develops from that experience is extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Thank you so so much. Um, I, uh, I I do want to share a couple of um, of brief announcements with everyone, um, and uh, and I, you know maybe we'll we'll have the chance to do a watch party uh, if we can figure that out. <laughs> we'll get very detailed descriptions and detailed uh, uh, instructions how to do that when the mini series comes out, uh, right. and in the. In the meantime, we have a few things going on, um, certainly at Washington Hebrew, uh, all of our ongoing classes and programs, and certainly uh, Shabbat services this evening uh, at 6 p.m. You can join by Zoom if you want to be able to see each other. You can stream the service if you're cooking or eating while you're while we're praying. Um, and you can also join on, on Facebook Live. But also coming up, we have a number of opportunities. Uh, certainly, we have on um, next Friday evening, we'll be celebrating uh, the Festival of Forum uh, at 6 p.m. In addition, you'll see much more coming out of, leading up to Forum. Uh, I think, I believe, starting this Sunday. Uh, also, March 13th, uh, is the Cantor's concert. Our two Cantors, Cantor Manovich, will be back with Cantor Bortnik. Uh, Together Again is the name of the, the concert. It's a Havdalah Saturday evening, Havdalah and concert. We hope you join us for that. Uh, Sunday, March 7th is our Women's Seder with Michelle Citrin, and hopefully many of you will join us. You, you don't actually have to be a woman to join and, and participate in that. So we invite you and welcome everyone to start preparing for, for the festival of Passover as well. Um, and actually, and I'm going backwards, but oh well, from the, the farthest away to the upcoming this Sunday, our uh, women of Washington Hebrew have a Hamantashen program with Susan Barokas. And so we hope you'll uh, think about joining us for that as well. I mentioned at the beginning, we have more of these opportunities coming up. The books are not selected yet, I will direct you to Jeff Bergman and Ruth Seif if uh, you have a suggestion. April 23rd and June 25th, so plenty of time to read. Um, I don't know if the timing for the June 25th is enough time from when, um, when Mark's next book comes out and when we'll be gathering, who knows. Uh, but, um, but again, it is wonderful to see everyone. And I know that, uh, um, that many of us are in the process of either having been vaccinated or getting vaccinated or maybe not yet. Um, please know that we are, uh, we at Washington Hebrew, your clergy and staff are, are remain here for all of you. Uh, while we are um, apart physically, we are certainly connected and spiritually and via technology. And if there's anything that we can do to support you and, and those you love, or if there's anything that we should know about, please be sure to let us know. And in the meantime, we um, we hope that everybody stays safe and healthy. And I want to wish to everyone a Shabbat Shalom. May it be a peaceful Shabbat. Um, may it be one that is filled with moments of joy and moments of blessing. And may each of us recognize and express that gratitude for the miracle of every moment. And may you find those miracles uh, each day uh, and every day, and especially on Shabbat, may you take a moment to just take a deep breath and reflect on all of the silver linings, all of those miracles and blessings, and certainly being connected to one another, being able to see each other's faces and names is a miracle and a blessing as well. So Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And thank you again to our um, to our guest and our, our author, Mark Sullivan, for, for his time and energy and certainly his, his beautiful writing.